your stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. Many of my clients reach out to me because they're in transition. Their children are hitting milestone ages. They want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday. And they want to develop clarity about their natural strengths, what their next adventure might look like. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shaped their lives, stories that uncover patterns and may unveil insights into dissatisfaction and also where their strengths lie and where they found and continue to find joy. This podcast's intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering the internal messages that are limiting their success and discovering how to shift their stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, visit elkinsconsulting.com and schedule a one-time 90-minute StrengthsFinder session. Well, our listeners are going to be lucky to hear this episode of Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will with my friend Thomas Jackson. Uh, We met on LinkedIn many years ago, and he has been to every no longer virtual event since it started in uh, February 2017. And um, listeners, you are going to hear a really different way of thinking that's going to make you smile. It's going to make you laugh. It's going to make you think. And um, Thomas, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. (laughs) So uh, you know how I start these because you've listened to some of these episodes. I'd love for you to share with our listeners something about yourself that most people don't know about you. Whenever I have an article where I'm showing somebody writing, I always make sure that they're left-handed because I'm left-handed and part of the left-handed majority. People act like it's a minority, but there's like half the people I know are left-handed. But I always look for somebody who's left-handed. I mean, that's one of those very subtle things that people may not realize, but whenever somebody's writing, they're, you know, they're writing Southpaw. Uh So it's something you notice. Yeah. Well, no, I just, I I try to write because, you know, I try to, I don't want everything to be right-handed centric, you know, because in school we had those, sometimes we had those Baskin Robbins desks where you had to write like that. And, you know, but it was just kind of a pain. I mean, if you're right-handed, you just do it like that. But if you're left-handed, you have to come all the way around. It wasn't a full desk. It was, you know. It was like what they had at Baskin Robbins at the time. Right. My mom and my husband are both left-handed. So oh, all I, right. I hear you. And you, you um, must have been one of those people that appreciated when I made um, notebooks for No Longer Virtual and I made some bound at the top, spiral bound yes. at the top for my mm-hmm. left-handed guests. And that was Bob's idea. I'm not sure if I have, no, because I write with pencil. If I have, you know, you always get that, with, you know, right there. Exactly. The yeah. the mess on your, across your pinky and the, the yes. edge of your pen from writing over your ink. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's funny because I think that's the only reason I notice left-handed people um, is because my mom and my husband are left-handed. Yeah, it, you have to see them writing. Exactly. My mom yeah. used to say that her teachers tried to make her write with her hands straight. And then okay, of course, yeah. and, and it just made her handwriting really messy. Is what it, it would did. have. Yeah. Or there, there were, te- I know I, I had teachers who were older and they were, um, they had to write right-handed. They just said, forget it. The right only thing I, I use the scissors right-handed because you don't get the ones with little green, um, uh-huh. green rubber around them. Right. And I cut meat with my right hand, but you know, you, you have the fork in the left hand. The, the knife in the right hand just seems to make sense. Right. You know, it's so funny that you brought this up because my husband plays guitar right-handed. Even oh, that's, like, that was a bone of contention because people are always like, well, why don't you play right-handed? I'm like, well, you know, why don't all right? They said, well, this hand is more important. Well, then why doesn't all, why don't all left-handed people play, why don't they play Jimi Hendrix style? I mean, it's just, <laughs> exactly. you know. Exactly. People just didn't feel like restringing or, you know. Right. You have to string the whole guitar upside down. Yeah. I I think, well, Paul Simon is left-handed and plays right. Exactly. I think it's how you learn, but anyway. All right. Well, enough about left-handed, right-handed. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Thank you. That's um, something that is interesting. And I don't, I don't think I would have known that about you, but it totally makes sense. It didn't seem right, I guess. Well, I know you as a a hyper observant person, you notice things that other people yeah. don't notice. Mm-hmm. So um, that doesn't surprise me that you notice it, but it is interesting because it's not something I would have considered. No. So um, when over the years, we've talked a lot about um, bosses and work cultures around hard workers versus the people that kind of do the minimum required and sometimes less than that. 
And one of the things you've talked about over the years is some of your really bad bosses and what made them really bad, which I think is an interesting perspective versus the bosses that you've actually enjoyed working for. So let's start with the bad boss story. Tell me about one that um, you noticed something about their leadership that was particularly egregious that made it really hard for you to work for them. Well, micromanagement, first of all, is something that's really, you know, it doesn't get anything done. It's not going to make, if they're like, if they're nitpicking, that's not really going to get things done. I've also noticed that all micromanagers are short because I've had bosses that are like six foot four. I mean, I know, I know that that's something we're not going to talk about that, but I mean, it's men. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never had a, a, a female micromanager. I oh, mean, right. I don't want to. I mean, like women, uh, the, problem with, the problem with female supervisors usually is that they do everything by the book. I mean, if a man does everything by the book, that's not good either. But, you know, if you do things off the menu, you know, because you know the book, you know the rules, but you can also be a little bit flexible. And mm-hmm. that, that seems to be a little bit better. But, you know, micromanagement is bad. I've had a couple abusive supervisors. Nobody's ever hit me, thank goodness. But I mean, but they've yelled. I mean, I'm at the point now when people start yelling Verbal abuse almost is like physical abuse. It's not as common. You can't report it. But I mean, it's just like when people start screaming. So well, when first of all, when they, when they get when they get to a certain decibel level, all you hear is blah blah blah. Of course, you just like kind of nod your Brown. head, weather the storm. It's like and the then, you know, it's like Brown. okay, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, sure, sure, sure. You're yeah. not really listening to the content of of what they're saying. Mm-hmm. It's like Charlie Brown and the adults in the in that it show. It is, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I don't always wonder why they didn't hire an actor, but that's another it's a totally, totally different story. We could do an hour on Peanuts. I love that series. So, Thomas, <laughs> tell me, tell me about a specific instance. Um, what happened leading up to the the boss yelling? Sometimes it's just walking in the room. No, one specific time though. I know okay. you have vivid memories. Oh, so, of course. I know. I, you have so to be a more... vivid memory of being yelled at and why that happened oh, and what happened after. I know. That's, you know, that's like, thank goodness it's in the rear view. You don't want to have, you don't have that in the present. Because, exactly. you know, once you get another one, you'll start remembering. But it's like if you meet a nice person, it's like that nice person then, you know, it's just kind of the same thing. But when you get a jerk, I mean, you know, all jerks are kind of the same, but nice people are individually nice. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that, but that's, you know, that's, no, it's, 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 it's true because, you know, usually it's just, you know, like jerks or no, but, but that's, um, let's get, getting back to jerks because, you know, at the resort, you know, I, I worked with like 200 wonderful, magnificent people. I'm in connect, I'm connected with many of them. It's like high school and the Phoenician is like the two main groups of people I have on LinkedIn that I actually know, but I met them before, but you know, the boss there, the one who made the schedule, he was just horrific i mean he would yell you know he had disdain you're supposed to greet everybody they have something called the three feet greet if you're in, in, like, three feet away from anybody whether it's a guest or a colleague you're supposed to say hello he just would kind of look at me just, you know he just would just look give me a look and you know and of course he he bore false witness that was the one i mean it's like you know he can lie and just say oh this doesn't mean anything you know he gave me a bad review so oh, this doesn't mean anything and a few months later i said that was why did you get such a bad review you know, and he was never satisfied. So, you know, even though I don't may not have a specific address, when somebody's never satisfied, no matter how hard you work, you can't win them over. It's not like if somebody is a hard person, like Bob Knight from the University of Indiana, like that coach, he was he was a hard ass. And but the thing is, he was very strict, but there was like reason behind it. So right. even though he would yell, I mean, he's trying to get the best out of people. Michael Jordan got the best out of people and sc- by screaming. Or not, not just screaming, but just pushing them to get their best performance. That's different than pretty much just, you know, like punching them in the stomach. Right, a lot of times with the abusive, I felt like I was being punched in the stomach. If he actually punched me, I could, you know, I could go to HR or something or, you know, get him on assault. But, you know, by just screaming and just, you know, saying you're a worthless, you know, you know what? I mean, they never, I don't think they use like cuss words, but I mean, certainly a lot of bad stuff. Then that, that's kind of what put me into rehab with that era in, in part two of my book that's still um, rumored. Construction. <laughs> yeah, it is. No, I mean, it is done, actually. I, I went back and read it a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not embarrassed by it. But, oh, you know, I, I haven't. Uh, yeah, I just have to, you know, get a proper edit and don't really don't know where to promote. But we can talk about that off the air. So it's pretty clear that um, there are kind of two categories in your head as far as 
what makes a really bad manager. And one is the micromanagement, you know, nitpicking every detail that doesn't help move things forward in any way. And then it's the the manager who is negligent and cruel that actually um, makes it clear that nothing you do is right. Yes, that's so, good. And there's also, you know, like, and then sometimes they'll, they'll like, be the, the, the dreaded, that's the way we've always done it. You know, I, I've had those bosses too, you know, but I mean, cause you know, like, sometimes they'll hire you for your talents and then when you try to, you know, use something or try to think of a different way, it's like, no, we do it this specific way. And that's the only way. And I'm thinking, because, like, you know, I had one boss, you know, he, 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 like, everybody who worked there was either very young. He had a lot of high school girls on their first job. His wife was there and his wife could probably have run the place, really. I mean, she was really good. But, you know, he would kind of think, you know, he was the man. She was the woman. So, you know, but, but she was really, really good. But, you know, he always had to, like, and he would find all these people that were just, you know, like, yes, men and women with low self-esteem. And, and all these people that would not, you know, like ever question anything he did. Right. And, but, you know, I would simply, you know, like just not, not question I did. I'm not saying somebody's wrong, but, you know, I would, you know, I would try to do something my way. And, you know, and when I say my way, it's nothing off the wall, you know, cause I had a previous job like that and they let me try things. If I did something really bizarre, they would kind of rein me in. They say, maybe you shouldn't go that far. Right. But, you know, they wanted me to do everything one way. It was almost like they wanted a puppy, you know, and it's like, you know, because, like, you know, and I was an, and I was an adult dog in this mm -hmm. case. But, you know, it's like, if, you know, you just just, you know, next time, just get some 17 year old that you can train and you can teach, right. you know, a lot less. So right. um, what I loved about your stories at the Phoenician at the resort was that there was this honor among the rest of the staff. Every story oh, that yeah. you wrote about that experience was about um, the the fact that it didn't matter, except for that one boss, it didn't matter what part of the resort you were staffing, everyone seemed to honor and and treat each other in a way that was respectful. It was, yeah, it was guys in the kitchen, girls in the bake shop. I mean, it was so many. I mean, the bartenders were great. I mean, it, really everybody, it was just, it was like a, a wide array of people, you know. Is so, that you know, like and I would help there? people out. Right. You stayed for a while there, right? How long did you? Actually, there? that was only one season. I mean, it was about seven months. Mm. You know, it, it feels longer. I know my old friend, Ted, the bartender, who I'm out of contact with. But, you know, he was there. You've only been here seven months because, you know, he would hear about, you know, oh, you can't believe what, you know, this boss did to me and said to me. And that boss actually liked him because he was they were they were golfers. I mean, it's a golf resort. Ah. But, you know, I mean, but, you know, even the people that that boss chose to like you know, sort of their teacher's pets, he still treated them like dirt. Ugh. You know, it's like they, they seem to like him. And then, but you know, I get yelled at too. And so it just wasn't, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. And, and it's interesting. Um, sometimes the person who is um, kind of the favorite still doesn't like the person because they see how they treat the other people. I can tell you, I've been in positions where I just couldn't tolerate it anymore, even though it was fine toward me. Mm -hmm. But I would see the behavior towards somebody else. And yes. for a little while, I could tolerate it. But at some point, I think I was about 40 when I decided I couldn't tolerate it anymore. And I would say something afterward, you know, I'd try not to do it in front of others. But I'd pull the yes. person aside or talk to them later and say, that was just rude. I don't know if you realize how badly that came out. Oh, yeah. No, I've seen that where, you know, well, first of all, you can't prove favoritism, you know, but you certainly know it when you're on the wrong end of it. Right. And, you know, and I've seen some people that, you know, that, that, that I that seem to like me and then they'll, they'll badmouth somebody else. And I'm thinking, well, then if you're going to badmouth somebody else, probably when I'm not around, you know, it's the same thing. It's sort of like gossip, you know, exactly. and I just don't really. And if you care about people, you don't gossip. That's another story. I've, I learned that one recently. Mm -hmm. And there was yeah. a lot of gossip on that that flower job where you know, there were only like eight people. And that was like all the young people. And the, 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 like that, you know, they were just it's like they were all married. And they would just gossip all day. It's like, it's nothing interesting. There's nothing sordid. That's because they're bored. Probably. They didn't, have, they didn't have enough to think about. Yeah. I mean, if you care about people, you'll say, oh, I heard, you know, like this person's you know, mother went to the hospital or, you know, they're getting surgery right. or something. That's different. But they say, hey, did you hear about, you know, it's not yeah, that interesting. Yeah. That's frustrating. Yeah. And it's not supportive and it doesn't help. So no. and now I kind of want to switch direction. I want to hear about the bosses that really worked for you, that, that encouraged you and motivated you to do different things and be innovative. 
Well, a lot of them, I mean, I, I know I'm thinking of a couple specifically. I'm so old that I have two all-time favorite bosses. They're in two different fields. But, you know, well, one of them was like a bank teller. Now, being a bank teller is a job where you start at the bottom and you stay at the bottom. It's just, you know, it, it's kind of monotonous work. But, you know, and, and that, that was also fascinating because usually the people you work with are great and the bosses are kind of jerks. There the bosses were great and the people around me were, you know, questionable. You know, it happens. But, you know, you take it where you can get it. I mean, you know, but that boss... She was, um, you know, like I balanced every day and then other people, it was like, I, I had a previous bank and I didn't balance. And then the woman acted like I was, you know, gave me the riot act. What do you mean you didn't balance? I want to go home at four o'clock and you're, you're going to make me here till four ten, you know? And it was just, you know, I was inconvenienced to her, but that's another story. She was not a good boss. But, but the second one, she told me how great, you know, that she was not, and because, you know, I made it easier and I lightened the load. She said the phrase that, you know, even though I don't really remember much about this job and its ancient history, she said, I'm proud of you. And that was just, you know, I'll remember that. That will be, that's her New York Times obituary. I mean, I even mm-hmm. told her that, you know, like years later. I mean, that just meant right. so much. And, yeah, you know, and I liked I her anyway. I mean, she had, a, she had a daughter my sister's age. So we, we kind of talked about, you know, we talked about young, young girls. I mean, because they, they were young girls at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she was married, like everybody's married or, you know, much like your conference, they're married or married for all intents and purposes. But that's, you know, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get mad because people have good unions and, and they're, they're like nice people. And, and that was helpful. You know, the mm-hmm. fact that she just told me that she was proud of me at that time, you know, because other people, you know, they'll try to, you know, like say, you know, we'll try to get you this, and, you know, get you in trouble for that. Mm-hmm. That was good. And the other ones. It seems like when when bosses are flexible and they let you do not not do whatever you want, but they let you try something different. You just try a new approach. Because mm-hmm. you know, I love training. I mean, that, that that's my forte actually. Even though I've never been officially a trainer at, at any job, I mean, I've, I've shown people the ropes and I'll teach them, give them pointers. But you know, training is never ending. Because like somebody will, somebody will come in a couple months later show me like a different technique, a different process. And I'll end up incorporating that, you know, and I know sometimes I'll give people credit, you know, I mean, if I remember that specific person, so you're the one who, who figured that one out, you know, you cut corners and you, you help that. And then you can honor them the way that your boss honored you. Yes, absolutely. Them. Wow. You did that. That was so it's cool. Good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did have a boss, like my, my first supervisor on, on the current job, he would thank me at the end of the day. I think just because there just wasn't a lot of appreciation. They're just people were busy. It's not so much that they're they're mean. I mean, there's a little bit of resentment because we stand around, we get overtime. But you know, that that that's their problem. You know, they're making six figures and you know they're they're getting mad that you know we're waiting for work. I mean, they don't say anything, we're like an octopus dealing cards, and there's like all this stuff coming, you're you know, eight, 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 eight arms. <laughs> you know, they don't say anything when it's like that. Uh-huh. Or, or when we taste the rainbow, that's because all the belts have different colors. And, you know, oh. it's like uh, right now I'm on, on a belt designated the yellow belt. And when you see all these packages for like blue and brown, it's like, you know, it, it's like all the colors of the rainbow. You got to I have to throw them back. I mean, you have that's to like cool. kind of far away. So you, you know? are you working at a UPS um, facility? Yes. Facility. Cool. Yes. Cool. And you oh, yeah, I'll be there. there? Uh, yeah. And th- this is our busy season. So, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. no, I'm I mean, we had, we had to go to work at midnight last night. Usually we start work around four. It could be sometimes it's three thirty, sometimes it's four thirty. Uh-huh. But that was midnight and tonight. They, they they let us go later at twelve thirty. It was supposed to be twelve fifteen. And that's, you know, that's a long 15 minutes. <laughs> I know. I mean, you get to spend 15 minutes in bed, which I guess is good because I do have to. I am probably going to have to like, go to bed at seven tonight, right. which is, is ridiculous. Well, yeah, actually, because like you, you never get used to the hours. You work on overnight. I sleep in two shifts. You know, there's an app, there's an afternoon nap, and then you know, sleep like five hours at night. You try to get what you can. And I'm usually wrecked on the weekend. So you how finally, long? How long have you been working there? Six and a half years. Wow. That's yeah, lovely. pretty much as long as I've been writing. Uh, uh, pretty much as long as I've been on LinkedIn. That's cool. That's cool. So yeah. Thomas, have you, have, did you notice a significant difference immediately with when the pandemic hit? Well, first of all, I'm glad that I had a job during the pandemic because it would it would have been nightmarish because, you know, usually when you're between jobs, you go to the library and the library was closed for a year. Right. So but, you know, I mean, it was a little bit busier. Nobody knew about social distancing. It was like Grand Central Terminal, people walking behind me. They're just going to the next area or they're going to the vending machine. I'm like six feet, you know, 
but it was um we were declared essential which is i thought you know i didn't i just thought it was just some silly job that we were doing but since we were declared essential i'm like oh, all right you know well it you was pretty much just, well, you know there's more volume yeah you know, there's more volume of packages now it's just it, it's a lot of work right. you know because there was one of those stories that like that some driver had had a route with 200 pieces and everybody got together and they all gave him a round of applause and it was this thing that got it went viral and i'm thinking who the heck has a ups route with 200 pieces because usually it's like 400 or 500 a day wow i mean that could be multiples so it's Probably not necessarily not 500 a... stops but it's, right. it's a lot and it's it's big boxes you know you think it's just going to be envelopes or, a, or like a small box you know if you're going to buy a sweater but I mean, there are, you know, like solo stoves. Like I'd never heard of a solo stove before the pandemic. And they're just these big stoves that you see. They're about, you know, like 40 or 50 pounds and they take up a lot of space. Yeah. Well, and because the the shipping companies are now figuring out that if they do particular box sizes, it's easier to ship, yes. to stack stuff in the truck and, and on planes. So uh, like the last time I ordered something from Amazon, it was one book and it mm-hmm. came in a box that was like four times too big for it. Yeah. I've no, oh, oh boy. Target is the worst with that target and Amazon. Cause like I've seen, you know, like there was like somebody bought a curtain rod and it was in a box and it's like, it's just a curtain. I thought something fell out of it. I thought, you know, maybe it was like an empty box, right. <laughs> but it was, that was just a good, some of these are like flim flam. You know, you just pick up the box. You know, you almost wonder if, you know, like if you could actually put healing. I don't have to get myth buses back on the air. If some of you just like have like a box float away, because some of them feel like They're the so box dumb. is going to float away, but you'd have, it'd have to be airtight. And then you have to like, I don't know how you would get the uh, the helium in there. <laughs> well, like, you know, well, that's, comparison. See, these are the things we think about when we work all night. You know, it's just like, <laughs> I can imagine. I, I get a lot of ideas for for articles in that. You know, I just I'm thinking of something or I'll hear a song. You know, I mean, there's, there's lots of things. There was a 20 minute version of Disco Inferno that somebody played today. Oh my you God. know, I mean, it was like they, they were. They, they, they usually don't play music in in the in the in the office, but I call it an office, even though it's a um, you know what it's it's, it's a warehouse. Uh-huh. But you know, but they were playing. You know, they were playing. You know, like disco and you know like the 70s kind of music. But, you know, and when I heard Disco Inferno, I was like, I recognize that, but it just kept going on and on. It's like, I had never heard the entire 20 minute version, but when you work all night, you might as well. You I mean, you time. might as well play in memory of Elizabeth <laughs> Reed. You know, it's like a 30 minute Allman Brothers song, you know, the full Emigata de Vida. You know, you, you might as well, because it'll get you through the night. Oh my gosh, Queen. <laughs> just yes. like going. That's like six and a half hours on one album, right? <laughs> yeah, some songs. You know, because like yesterday was such a long day. I mean, that was just, well, see, usually it's, you know, like at Christmas or the holidays, it's, um, it's long. I mean, like the first hour is super busy, but then it just levels off. It's really about the same number of packages just in a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. But it just, I mean, the packages just kept coming and coming. And some, and I've made the reference to it, the trouble with tribbles from the original Star Trek. Because, <laughs> you know, like one, it, it starts out and it's cute. And then all of a sudden, all the stuff just keeps coming down, you know. And then I always, I did wonder if that, if that, that show was actually like an allegory to drug addiction because it starts out and it's cute, and then it just takes over your life and it becomes an entire big mess. Oh, I bet Gremlins could qualify under that too. That could too, but that's that actually does that. that and then, you know, because I have an article about absolutely everything, I wondered if Gremlins was, you know, like just like the importance of having an only child because when they had one Gremlin, it was cute. And then when the gremlins started multiplying, they were just not as nice. And, they, and then they got evil. Well, I can tell you that I've heard that the third child could be evil. Yeah. <laughs> but shh, don't tell my sister. No, no. Well, I, yeah. Of course, I, I would think the children say that save the best for last, but you don't say that to the second three. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, Thomas, if you were going to um, something to bosses, that are listening to this podcast, something that would inspire them, not a do not do something, but a definitely do something. Where's a positive lesson that you could say, this is what brings the best out in me and makes me work to my possible best. Communicate, listen. Because, you know, I've had bosses that pretty much listen. They pretty much wait until you're done talking and then they just like, yeah, whatever. And then they're going to say whatever they wanted to say. And that's not, that's not effective. But there are others 
you know, that actually will listen and they'll at least take it under advisement. You know, even if they're not going to make sweeping changes right now, I have had, that was one of my other very good bosses when I made hotel reservations. Sometimes I would suggest something to be changed and, you know, he'd say, okay, I'll do that. And little by little, like later on, it was changed. I didn't get credit for it, but the problem was solved. So I don't need people to say, oh, he's the one who did that. You know, the problem was solved. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not intellectual property. I don't Thank need you. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And, you know, and, and we, we could work more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Things flowed better. But it is nice. I mean, like that other boss that said that she was proud of you. It's always, um, I, I just find it to be really powerful to give even minor recognition, even if he didn't say it in front of other people, but just say, hey, Thomas, that was a good idea. Yeah. Oh, no, that, that, that makes a big deal. I mean, I remember every compliment, not because there are so few, but they are individual and it's nice. Yeah. The difference between a nice person showing up in different ways versus a mean person that always shows up the same way. Yes, absolutely. I mean, because if somebody, you know, most, most people that are insulting, it is pretty much you suck is what they'll say or some version of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's, that's just, you know, it, it's all the same, but when somebody says something individual at the time, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's important. It means something. I never thought about that before. I so appreciate that, that comment because I, I, I think what it does, it's not necessarily that the behavior is always the same in somebody that's mean or, or behaving badly, but that they make you feel the same way no matter what they're doing. When yes. somebody is nice to you, it can have a, such a different colorful response in your mm -hmm. sense of being. Yes. So no longer virtual. Let's talk about that. Oh, absolutely. The only conference that matters. That's a much, thank you. That's a much better topic. Because, you know, when I was your age, we would connect beyond the keyboard. And now we're just stuck on the keyboard. Darn it. And here we go. We're on our way. I'm yes. so excited for this year. I, Park City, Utah. It's a little harder to get to than the other locations we've done. Yes. But, oh, my gosh. I was there in August for my mother and her twin sister's 75th birthday celebration. And it is such a neat town. I'm so excited to, if, if for most of the people that are coming, they haven't been there before. And I'm so excited to introduce that part of the world to our tribe of professionals attending this. Yeah, because I've been to Salt Lake City and I was there and I went to a jazz game mm -hmm. and looked around. I mean, you know, look at the Mormon Tabernacle, which is kind of interesting. But, Pretty. you know, when I left I, when after the jazz game, I was like, can I go home? <laughs> you know, there's, there's not a whole lot to do there. They, so, you know, it kind of put me off to Utah. Yeah. But, well, you know, then when I saw that, you know, I mean, I I'll agree. go anywhere. I mean, it's, I mean, I don't ski. Because I think that that's one of the major allures of mm -hmm. Utah that might be, I mean, it'll, it'll probably still be snowy. It should March, be. Early March. Yeah. But I explored uh, southern Utah for the first time. I've been to Salt Lake a few times. I um, graduated from Western Governors University, which is based in Salt Lake. So I have some familiarity with it. Mm -hmm. But um, my husband and I drove down in February this year and spent a week exploring the St. George area. So we saw mm -hmm. Zion National Park and Bryce okay. National Park, the canyon. Um, and definitely that is worth exploring. Salt Lake City oh. is good for a day or two because they have some really good restaurants. Right. But in general, and they actually have a couple of good museums. And um, But if I was going to go for an art town in that part of the country, I'd go to Boise, Idaho, which oh, okay. actually is more, more artsy than Salt Lake, but slightly mm -hmm. smaller. But really, Park City, it's just this little ski town and um, great restaurants and a very decent distillery up there, a handful of places that just are really unique, I think. Okay. So I'm excited to introduce the group to it. Right. I mean, that's I mean, because, you know, like, I mean, I don't really, I mean, because, you know, I, might, I don't know what it'll be my favorite city, but I mean, because, you know, I know you'll have to like fly to Salt Lake City and then there's like two buses right. to get to Park City. Because I am coming in like that, like the day before, like I, I like coming like early, not like a day before, but, you know, I'll be oh, in because you have to come in for the, um, for the night. Actually, that's a good question. Was there like a, a meeting at the bar for the first one? Because I, I couldn't get to the, um, at the Ritz Carlton. Um, yes, in Atlanta. That, yeah, because like I didn't get to the uh, the bar the first time. The second time, that's where I met Tom and Kurt, among others. <laughs> oh my but, god! You know, that really is. I mean, it, it's now become a three day. It has because so, that you know you get to see everybody, you get back, and then you get to meet some of the new people. It's like, well, oh, I've heard about you. 
Yes. And that first. You know, and then people can win you over because there are people I had never met before, had no, I, I had no frame of reference on Heather, oddly enough. Because I mean, wow. you know, she had, she had written, I mean, like, and you know, it was like, I knew about some people. I knew about Spurvy and I, I knew, I knew who you were. It was kind of the whole thing. And I got the whole party started. Plus, I love to travel. I love to travel, and it got me into a Ritz Carlton. So, you know, I figured, you know, what's the worst that could happen? I have to say, Thomas, planning that first one was a nail biter, and so well, much. Oh yeah, you never know. I had no idea what to expect. I still don't know what to expect each year. It no. always comes out better and surprising from what it I is. have in my head, what I'm anticipating. Mm -hmm. That first year, um, yeah. So we. Bob and I arrived that Wednesday afternoon and checked into the Ritz Carlton in downtown Atlanta, which was a phenomenal location for this event oh, yes. for the very first one. The food was outstanding. The service was extraordinary. And I had never stayed at a Ritz Carlton before. I'd never you had peach jelly beans, if nothing else, you know. It was, <laughs> it was just so nice. And the thing that really caught me off guard, even though I have planned events for years. I've usually been planning them for another organization. And when I was a director of sales at a hotel, I planned them. And I always welcomed the organizer of an event by having a little special treat in their room and thanking them for selecting our hotel. Yes. But it didn't even occur to me that someone would do that for me. So when I checked in at the Ritz Carlton, which I highly recommend if anyone goes to downtown Atlanta and they want a place to stay, try to get a deal at the Ritz. Because when I got into my room, there was this beautiful tray with the French macaron cookies and a few pieces of fudge and um, a sugar tray with the no longer virtual logo on oh. it. And it was so beautiful and a handwritten note thanking me for my business. And mm -hmm. I will never forget that experience because that was the first time and I took pictures of it. And then of course I'm spoiled. We show up in Denver at the Hotel Indigo and it was nothing like that. It was a nice. No, hotel. that was yeah. That that was a come down. I, I mean, I mean, I'd recommend know. it if you're just kind of hanging out in Denver. It was nice right and new, a great location. The location was fabulous. Yeah. But um, I got a little note, a, a a a printed, typed note thanking me for my business. A template. And a card yeah. for a buy one get one free drink at the hotel bar, which of course. That means it's still $26, even if yes. you're only buying one. <laughs> so I remember I say the phrase, I don't drink so much, it becomes a drinking contest. But we were, <laughs> we were with the last at the last conference, which better, thank God it's not the last conference. But you know, it was like a $22 glass of wine. It was like Amy and Heather were like, what is like a 20? It's just a glass of wine. I know. <laughs> you can get a whole That's bottle funny. for $22, Absolutely. and it's not, you know, like cold duck or something. I mean, it's you right. know, it's like well, good wine. And unfortunately, Park City is not going to be a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> no. Especially but I don't that. drink, so I can just go, I can hang out and I can see. Right. But I'm I'm excited for it. I know you're going to be there. Uh, Andy Vargo is going to be there. We're going to have some of the people that have been there before. We also already have a handful of people coming that have never been before. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so excited to expose them to this group, to have yes. them experience what you and I have experienced for four years. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you never know. Because some people will just kind of pop out there. You know, you had no, you never, you never heard of them before. And then afterwards. You know, they, they go from, I always put people in three categories. There's the supporting players as extras, supporting players, and stars. I mean, like, everybody really is an extra because you just don't know who they are. They're just walking around life. Supporting players are nice, but you don't really know them, and stars are the biggest. And right. some people went from extras to stars in about 20 minutes. Oh, I love That's kind of how Ben Walker was, because okay. I had never heard of him. I mean, I just had no who, frame of reference. Was? Ben Walker. From the oh, first okay. one and the second one. He better yeah. get his silly self. Yeah, he better get it. I think he tried to get, yeah. he had like something else planned for when it was in Buckhead. So he couldn't get there. I don't remember. I mean, like Chicago was kind of, that you know, was that was, one. yeah. So tell me, I know we shouldn't name names, but tell me one other person who went from extra to star so quickly. Oh, well, you know, there are people that I've written. Oh, geez. Jason Elkin was another really good. I mean, because I just, you know, it's not that, you know, not that you're going to say like, oh, what's this person like? But, you know, he, you know, he was nice. I mean, and that was, that was at the fourth one. So there was a very small group. Yeah. Well, and he's terrific. He's out. Oh yeah. No, he Montana. is. I mean, you, you, I mean, he's in somewhere in Montana. I mean, great. I mean, that's yeah. still, that's like, he'd be 400 miles away. This is a big or state. More. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Big state. Yeah. yeah we we, when I lived in Arizona, cause like where I live now, you can go 
to like four different states within a couple hours. But like when I lived in Phoenix, you drive four hours in any direction, you're still in Arizona. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, some states are like that. Montana is like that. It takes yeah, it is. four and a half, five hours. I mean, you can like yeah. swing down to Wyoming, but you know, really it's, you're not going to get, you're not, you're mostly, it's like you can go one part of Montana to the other part. Yeah. And but, of course, if know, they had their stupid uh, air, um, no, um, if, if they wouldn't like fix the runway last year, <laughs> they do that in June. But, that know, made me so mad. Thomas, the other interesting thing about Montana and traveling across Montana is how different the culture is in every community. Like oh, you yeah. go all the way up to the northeast edge of, of Montana mm-hmm. in Sydney and Glasgow and um, Glendive and Mile City. And then, um, and that is ranch country, oil country. Oh, yes. Um, really like 20 years behind in, in pop culture. I mean, really, yes. really interesting place and very sparsely populated. The whole Northern part of Montana is very sparsely populated. Right. And you go down to the Southeastern side toward Wyoming and, and Colorado. And um, there's the, the Indian reservation and Billings and um, it's more industrial. Mm-hmm. And, but there's also the edge of Yellowstone national park. And Cody, Wyoming is in that corner. So you yes. go down right into Cody, which I did get to go see Mike Johnson and Cody, and he was at the Denver NLV. Oh, yes, he but was. But then you go um, to the West, and you are in the West because it's on the other side of the, the divide. And yeah, oh, yeah. This total hippie town is like Boulder, Colorado. Right. Some states are like that because I like Missouri, I mean, they say Missouri is like America and Pennsylvania is that way, too, because you have St. Louis over here, Kansas City over there. And then in the between is, is everyone else. Exactly. You know, like in, in Pennsylvania, you have like Philadelphia, Georgia. you have Pittsburgh. Yeah. And then there's this vast expanse. I mean, it's not as big as Montana, granted. But, but you know, still, I mean, it's. It feels like you're crossing state lines every time you go into oh, a new city. Absolutely. <laughs> Thomas, this has been so much fun. I'm so glad we did this. And yeah. I get the honor of saying that I was the first person to host Thomas Jackson on a podcast. Yeah, you're right. I mean, because like I don't, you know, I don't beg. There's a story about when I begged and, it, you know, you win and you lose. So I'm not going to be like, <laughs> validate me, love me, put me on a podcast. But, you know, if somebody <laughs> invites me, that's different. Much like a vampire, well, I have to be go. invited into the room. Before. This could be the tidal wave. <laughs> it could be. I mean, you know, I can't control that. You know, I mean, it's kind of like when you have like, yeah, like you like you fall into like, get into a relationship. I mean, you you have to go back way back into the archives for this. But you know, like you know, like, and then all of a sudden, like, oh wow, now everybody's going to be interested in me. Oh, actually, when you get married, everybody suddenly is interested. In you. It's like, where were you all those years when you know, when like, I, I couldn't single. get arrested. You know, when <laughs> <Exactly>. yeah. <laughs> I do think about that sometimes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas. I will definitely um, share this with our listeners. And listeners, you would do yourself a big favor if you checked out Thomas Jackson on LinkedIn. I'll have a link in the show notes associated with this podcast. Start reading one of his 400 or so. um, Well, 3,000. Yeah, I write 400 a year. And and you know what the secret to writing that many? Yeah, no, I've been doing that since 2016. You you have to have no life and you have to write about a time (laughs) when you actually had one. Well, you, I love a lot of your work just makes me laugh out loud. It mm-hmm. always um, puts a different image in my head of who you are and how you oh, see yeah. the world. And I, I just, I think, um, I think more people would be interested if they just took the time to read three or four of your articles in a row yes. to kind of get a better feel for where you're going with things, because they're so creative. They're so creative. Yeah. Cause if you come in on like the first time, you know, if the first one you read is like something where, you know, like I've described other things like what in the world, but then, you know, exactly. it's you kind of like how like on the TV series, <laughs> you have to go back to the first season. Cause if you turned on happy days in like the eighth year, it was bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. But then, you know, but you know, like in the first year, you know, it was Fonzie and Richie and they were all hanging around at Arnold's, <laughs> but you know, when you go back, then you see the trajectory and you kind of see then when they jump the, the star. character and, development and yeah. yeah. And I've definitely seen development. <laughs> Mm-hmm. in the way that you have written over the last few years. So, oh yeah, Thomas, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Sarah. It's always a pleasure. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, 
My book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places. And the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you. Could you tell me that you're going away?